Paper was like gold in medieval times. I want tobacco. Sugar. That everything we thought we knew about the world might turn out to be completely wrong. It's almost a drug to me. It's something that I can't seem to get control of. I know it's do or die, and I keep telling myself that. But it's not do or die. It's do or be disabled and or die. You could have a stroke. You might not be able to see your children anymore. When I look at myself in any mirrors, I don't like it. I don't like it at all. The doctors basically said, we've never had someone your size in this hospital. We don't know how to treat you. The UK is the fattest country in Western Europe. I weigh 33.8 stone. This means Alice is super morbidly obese. I tend to eat my snacks when the kids aren't around um, because I don't want them to see it. It's sort of my secret. Because this has been my go-to for so many years, the fulfillment that I get from anything else doesn't quite match the fulfillment that I get from food. I don't think anyone should have to live like this. I feel imprisoned by food. I feel like it's got a control over me that I can't seem to get out of. My body is not doing things it should at my age. I should be able to be running around with my kids, enjoying time out and about, but it, it's an impossibility. It might be a defeatist attitude, but I feel like I am defeated. There just doesn't seem to be the fight in me that can come through. I mean, I can fight for a week, I can fight for a month, but I need this fight to be for the rest of my life. And it, it's really hard. Obesity has been a problem for Alice since childhood. When I was bullied at school, it got quite bad to the point when I was sitting on the bus and they used to flick matches at me. They used to spit at me, sing songs at me. I sort of found a friend in food. I used to spend my pocket money on cream cakes and chocolate and sweets. And I remember hiding food. I remember taking food from the cupboard and sticking it down the side of my bed to the point where not even my parents knew the extent of my eating until they'd found, you know, my stashes of wrappers and sweet packets and things. This is Darren. At his heaviest, he weighed 40 stone. I just eat for the sake of eating, basically. That's what made me feel a bit better about myself. I was ruining my body, getting bigger. At that time, in that moment, I felt happy. So that's what I did. Darren would eat his way through 11,000 calories a day, over four times the recommended amount. My normal daily food intake was ridiculous. I'd get up in the morning, it'd be like two sausage sandwiches, tea biscuits, get a sandwich and a pasty or a pack of crisps, chocolate bar, a bottle of pop. And it just seemed every couple of hours. My mum would try and make the effort then to do me a dinner. It's all cooked healthy, it's all cooked right. Decent plate of food that's going to fill you. Try and aim me to fill me for the rest of the night. But me being me, I'd eat that. And then three hours later, I'd be thinking about what takeaway I'd order. Darren is super morbidly obese and his heart is paying the price. I've got an irregular heartbeat. So my heart beats fast and out of the rhythm. And some of my sides to have something like this it isn't healthy or safe. Well, I'm on the list now for an operation called a cardioversion, where they put me asleep and they re shock my heart back into rhythm. The doctors basically said, We've never had someone your size in this hospital with this problem. We don't know how to treat you. 
Obesity can lead to a number of life-threatening conditions, something Alice is only too well aware of. My dad suffers with health problems and they could see the way that it was going to go. Hiya. My dad can relate to me, I can relate to him. We're both big, we both understand what my relationship with food is like and what his is. So how's your weight? It's hard to do it. It's... I know it's hard. Also, I would have done it years ago. I mean, at one time I was nigh on 30 stone, which for me was horrendous. It was uh, Chinese every night. The life expectancy of severely obese people like Alice and her dad, Pete, can be reduced by up to 20 years. It's upsetting to see how my dad has changed in the last five or six years. His health really has deteriorated and it is due to health complications through obesity. We can see me, problems I've got. I know. You know, I've had a double heart bypass. I've got problems with my eyes. I've lost one leg. It looks like probably going to lose the other. And do you want the same? Did you make a conscious effort to lose the weight? No. No, I didn't. I lost weight. No, naturally. You know. <laughs> you had your leg chopped off. Yeah, that, that didn't weigh as much as I thought. If you carry on the way you carry on, uh, you'll finish up like me. Give it a go and try and lose some. Yeah. Please. All right. My dad is my biggest critic. He's seen it throughout my whole life, how my relationship with food is. And the more he tells me that I'm going to put myself in danger, um, the more I turn to comfort eating. And it's difficult. It's a never-ending cycle. Thirty thousand people in the UK die every year as a result of obesity. Aged just twelve, Darren weighed a massive twelve stone. At school, I definitely got bullied. Even when I was in a good group of people and they had my friends in school, there was always them kids who would show fat. At you. They used to go to school, get bullied, come home, be sad, eat to comfort myself. Food was my thing, and obviously it just got out of hand. Where the fact of no matter what emotion I felt, whether it was happiness, sadness, angry, food would be the comfort eternal. The death of his dad sent his eating into overdrive. My dad passed away when I was 18, and he actually passed away on Father's Day. And when he passed away, it was just guttering. A lot of my family do say that eating got quite out of control then, but I don't like to say it because people lose their dad every day. I might have coped with it with food. Well, I did cope with it with food because that was my comfort before my dad died. So the sadder I felt, the more I yet to make me feel better to try and get it back. But obviously, after a few years of doing it, when you start getting super obese, you start getting more sadder. It was just one of them cycles. I just didn't know what to do with it. 27-year-old Darren still lives at home with his mum, Susan. That was about probably when you were about five. I love that photo of you. It's all right, like, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Me and my mum have always been close. We just flow, we just click. Look at you there, you're so cute. When was that? That was when you were about 12. You can see I'm starting to get bigger there. Yeah, now, can't you? oh, yeah. It was such a problem getting close to fit you at the time. Yeah. And obviously, you wanted to be like all the other lads, you know, you wanted to be able to wear the same That's clothes there, did you? But clothes shopping was the least of Mum's worries. When looking back, I think I suffered with anxiety a lot, you know, because I was constantly worried about you. You'd be sound asleep on the set eight, and I'd literally sit and watch you. I could see you holding your breath through the night, and I used to think, he stopped breathing. My zebra apnea just affected me massively. He actually told me that I would stop breathing something like 50 odd times in an hour. No mum, like, wants to know that Potentially, the son's going to go before you. That's not how things were meant to and be. No, no parents have to marry the son, should they? No, and that was one of my greatest fears. 
I was very frustrated and sometimes I felt like I wanted to shake him and just say, look, look at what you're doing to yourself, look at what you're doing to us, you know. When is it going to start registering your head, you know, that you're going to have to change, you know, you just can't keep going on the way you are, you're going to end up dying. Unable to break the cycle, Darren was sucked into a downward spiral. I started doing drugs, like cocaine and stuff. And I got took into hospital because of him, because of my heart rate and my size. And the doctor told me you can't have it no more. Then I got to the point where I thought, you've messed it up that much for yourself. Now, we your size, just go and have some drugs. And if, you, if you finish it, it finishes. If you go, you go. And the doctor said, call your family up. And I, I had to explain to my brothers and my mum what I'd actually been doing with my body and that I might not make tomorrow. Somebody just proper clicked with me. See my mum's face just drain. Good. When I actually laid in the hospital bed, I did have a lot of time to just sit there and think by myself. And looking back and I was thinking, how are you living here? Like, how, why have you accepted this? Like, why, why is this your life? Why have you let this get to this point? Like, do something now before it definitely is too late. The doctors have told you that you need to sort yourself out. Your family want you to do it. You need to want to do it. At the moment, I weigh round about 30 stone. Alex is super morbidly obese, which affects all aspects of his everyday life. Mobility-wise, I can't walk that far. I get really out of breath quickly. I have a lot of back ache and a lot of joint problems as well. And that is just basically down to too much weight. I live on a second floor. It really, really takes it out of me to do the stairs to come up here. His lack of mobility means he spends a lot of time in his room alone. I wouldn't say that I'm a recluse, no. And the only reason being is uh, that I am quite a sociable person. Sometimes I hide myself away, but it's more because I enjoy watching TV. I've definitely made a nice safe haven for myself and I definitely think that I should be going out more. Alex's daily intake doesn't just consist of food. Every day, he needs medication to keep him alive. I take about 11 tablets a day. There are different kinds of tablets. I have main painkillers. I have metformin, which is for my diabetes. I have esomeprazole, which is for my stomach. Sickness tablets. These three here are all for blood pressure. These are the, the vitamin D tablets that I take because I don't get enough sunlight. And that's about it. I get a lot of side effects because there's that many tablets that they all start affecting each other. There is times in the past where I've tried to stop uh, as many of the medications as I can, but unfortunately it just made me more ill because, you know, <laughs> These are medications that I need. It's not like I'm just taking them for the sake of it. Hopefully one day be able to lose some of them, the, the medication that I take. But I do think that there's some medications there that I will probably have to always take. It's a horrible existence. But it's not just health issues that are affected by obesity. For many people, there is also a social stigma. Everything you watch is boring. <laughs> For Alice, this meant she didn't think she'd ever have a serious relationship. Uh, no. <laughs> well, yeah, I like this. I met Mark eight years ago, and I was on a night out, and I'd seen him. And he asked for my number, and I remember being quite shocked. And I was like, you're asking for my number? 
But we just sort of connected. We we got on well. Oh <laughs> but in the back of my head, I was thinking, you know, he's going to leave me. There's going to be someone else out there that's thinner or, you know, better looking. But he hasn't. What time are we picking the kids up? Four o'clock. Okay. I fell pregnant when I was 28 and I weighed 28 stone, but I was very nervous about the complications of being my size and being pregnant. It's something that nobody would recommend. It's really a miracle that we conceived at that size. I was worried that something was going to go wrong. I could die from high blood pressure, from diabetes. I felt like I was very lucky, very lucky having such a healthy pregnancy. <laughs> now six years old, twins Dylan and Grace gave Alice a new determination to tackle her obesity. Ugh, it makes a funny noise. When the children were born, I thought that, you know, this is it. This is life-changing for me. There's no way I can be a proper mother to the kids if I'm this size. But you know, old habits die hard and I ended up back into the routine. It's almost a drug to me. It's something that I can't seem to get control of. Very good. Although it's a constant struggle for Alice to stay healthy, she tries hard to make sure her kids don't follow in her footsteps. My kids are not big, they're not fat. I try and make sure they get exercise, that they eat well, but if I don't make positive changes in my life and lose weight, then I probably won't get to see them growing up, having kids. And it does break my heart, it really does. Who wants gravy? Not me, mummy. Not you, I do. There you go. Yeah, it's not bad. Yeah, it's I think my children have quite a wide understanding of what good food is and what bad food is because I do talk to them about nutrition. So they know the veg is healthy, potatoes are uh, part of your diet. What do you want for tea tomorrow? Pizza. They know that sweets and chocolate and crisps and biscuits and cakes are not healthy. How does it make you feel when I talk about dying young and like preparing the kids and preparing you for when I'm not here. It's a bit morbid, really. I'm hopeful that I'll see 40, but it's all going to depend on what changes I make to my life. <sighs> Does it upset you? A little bit, yeah. You've planned your own funerals, like giving up. But well, I haven't given up. I'm trying to... But that's to... the way it sounds. It's really difficult for me to talk about it because it's a loved one and it's, I know, I don't know, deep down, I don't want to see her go. It's heartbreaking, really, that she's got to that point where she feels that she's given up. She's very stubborn. And, you know, the more you push Alice into doing something, the less likely she is to do it. Sometimes I get a goal in my head and I think, right, I'm going to lose, like, a stone. And then once I've lost that stone, I feel the need to... It sets me back because I relax then and I think, well, I've done it. And then before I know it, I've put more on. A lifetime of overeating has damaged Darren's heart. Without a vital operation, he may not live to see his 40s. So what's going on with the operation right now, then? Everything has to be done in a certain order, and I just have to follow that order and just have to be keep doing it. As long as I'm losing weight and better in my life, that's what matters. But Darren is so obese, surgeons worry that the life-saving surgery could kill him, and his brother is worried. For you to move forward from this point, you know, the surgery's paramount, obviously, or they wouldn't have asked you to do it in the first place. I think the biggest thing for Darren right now is to focus on his operation. It's not just about the sacrifices of not having a pizza or not having a few beers with his mates. It's, it's a lifelong sacrifice for his health and his well-being. But with them sacrifices are going to come his opportunities in life. It's tough being watching someone who could succeed at anything they want to do in life fail. 
For me, the, the biggest issue was that you lacked belief in yourself. I'm going to get where I need to be in life and I'm going to get that job and I'm going to have my own family and I'm just going to flourish and just keep going and enjoy the life that I'm meant to be now enjoying. Like, I need to do it now because I've had health scares and that. But, like, I can't come back from it unless I lose weight. I think it's the first time in my life that he's finally turned a page within his own mental attitude. I hope that's the case anyway. Now we're in 20 minutes. We need to be at the top of there. Let's go. Let's go, pal. Darren needs a life-saving heart operation, but first he needs to lose some weight. Come on, in. let's set the pace. It's just a one thing. Determined to make a change, Darren took on personal trainer Mike. All right. Halfway there now. The heart rate's out. I went up his office, sat down with my mum, bared all with him and his team. I remember you coming in with your mum and it brought a tear to my eye, if I'm honest. I think everyone in the room at that moment sort of cried at it because your mum said, I don't want to bury my son on the way out. You took three steps down the stairs and got cramp. <laughs> I, remember, I remember thinking to myself, how on earth am I going to get him to lose a target of 20 stone in a year when he can't even walk three steps down the stairs without getting cramp? Step one was to take an accurate weight reading of the junk food junkie, and the result was shocking. 255.8 kilos, which is 40 stone and three pounds. When Mike took me out from my first walk, I was 40 stone, three pound. Literally, I walked up the road, it was a flat road. I walked 30 steps. We started walking, I went him, and he didn't stop me. My back's hurting me, my legs are hurting me, I feel tired. OK, focused, power through, man. They are one of the first people who was like, sat me down and went, look, you're big. There's no ifs and buts about it. I know what I need to do to make you lose weight, but you need to do it yourself with me. You didn't know where to turn, and you just, you were, you were eating yourself to death. I needed someone to, one, say they've got the belief in me like you did, and two, was, I'm not going to put up with no crap off you. I'm going to push you, and I expect you to keep pushing with me. 30 steps up. I'll happily be pushed and pushed and pushed. If it means we're getting to the things like this, climbing literally mini mountains. Go on, touch your top, touch your top, touch your top, touch it. Touch it. Yes! Oh, I feel better. Oh. Darren may feel like he's on top of the world, but his weight loss journey has only just begun. That looks rich, the bomb. Let's go. Let's get on. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Trainer Mike knows Darren is battling more than just his weight. He is also battling a food addiction. Behind me is my local takeaway one. I'd go to three or four times a week easy. I've been known to come here twice a day sometimes. It could be kebabs, parmesans, fish and large chips. But basically, whatever I fancy that night, but it'd always be the bigger option of the food. It'd always be the large size. Thank you. If you look as well, next door is the filming services, and the harsh reality is that's where I probably would have ended up. I took the bold step to buy them from the takeaways and we made the poster together and we put it in every single takeaway and Teesside. Told him to keep it behind the counter and asked the staff not to serve him. This was the first takeaway that we brought it into and they accepted it for me. They knew what we were doing, they supported what we were doing. Other takeaways jumped on it, what he used to use. And they all got behind me. I had to be bold and I had to make a statement and I had to do that on the very first day because if I didn't, he would have thought he could get away with things with me. That's where it needed to happen. I needed the harsh reality of seeing my face on a poster, saying, banned from this takeaway, save this lad's life. And then words really over me. Recent research suggests that obese people are up to 80 times more likely to develop type 2 diabetes. A cup of tea, Alice. And with Alice's dad already a sufferer, Mum Jane is worried. Dad seems like he's in quite high spirits today. I think he's been an idiot. And you're gone the same way. I really thought when you had the twins that you would change your life around for them. Nothing else has done it. This is the frustration for me, is that everyone says, well, what about the kids, but... Well, what about the kids? 
Do you want to see it's... your children go to secondary school? Yeah, of course I do. You know, do you want to watch Grace get dressed up in a white wedding dress? Yeah. Well, it's not going to happen if you carry on how you are. If you can't do it for the kids, you want to do it for yourself, otherwise you're going to be the one who's in your dad's position now. I know it's do or die. I know that. And I keep telling myself that. But it's not do or die. It's do or be disabled and or die. You could have a stroke. You might not be able to talk. You might not be able to see your children anymore. But you're still alive. What kind of life will that be for you? And it is hard for the ones who have to cope with it. You're not the only one who's going through this. And you're not the only one who's going to go through your future. You're putting Mark in a position where he's going to be a single father. How is that going to be fair to anybody? Only you can make the difference, Alice. I know. Alice, can we sit down and have yeah. a chat? Back home, partner Mark feels the time is right to give Alice an ultimatum. There's so many things I want to say, but they're too hurtful to talk about. Yeah, but maybe I need to hear that. Maybe that's what I need to hear. Tell me straight. Stop snacking, because we've got something here, like the, the kids, us, and I don't want to see them to see you in a wooden box by the age of 40. It does get me really emotional hearing Mark talk about these things because it's something that we don't really discuss. So hearing it from him, it, it brings it back, brings it home. I gave up smoking when the kids were born, so you can give up snacking. I know you've seen countless doctors, but I think you need to see another one. OK? Yeah. I think that's the first step. Like so many things, the roots of obesity can be found in childhood. Over 20% of children leaving primary school are classified as obese. It was quite a normal child, just played about like normal young boys do, climbing trees and all that sort of stuff. And life-changing events suffered in childhood are still affecting 41-year-old Alex. I started hanging about with some kids and one thing sort of led to another and ended up uh, into a situation where we were, the younger ones were getting sexually abused, including me, uh, by the, the older guys. I was around about eight. I eventually did say something. The guy that mainly did things to me, because he was at 15 at the time, he got charged, but there was no jail sentence or anything like that. With his abuser still at large, Alex felt at risk. It was like hell. It really was. I think psychologically, that has, like, ruined my life. It's quite deep stuff. After the abuse happened, I started eating. A lot. I felt it was the only thing to do was to make myself look ugly. I had the feeling that if I didn't look good, like if I was really big, maybe someone wouldn't want to hurt me or that. And I had that in my head for quite a while and I, I started eating just because I thought, well, it will get the weight on. The foods were were just normal snacky stuff, like sandwiches and a lot of bread. There was just always little bits of food that I could eat. The more and more I stayed in, the more weight I put on. When I was 11, I would be out 11 stone, 12, 12 stone, and it just ballooned all the way up. The biggest I was was 35 stone and a few pounds. That was the biggest I've ever been. When I look at myself in any mirrors, I do think to myself, you know, I, I need to get back on this because I can see myself. I don't like it. I don't like it at all. So I decided to change that way of thinking. And that's where it was hard because at that point, food was a comfort to me. It was an addiction. Alex used food as an escape. I wish that I hadn't done it. I really do. 
But I, I remember feeling at the time that it's the only thing I could do. But determined not to let his past define him, Alex took the positive decision to come out about his sexuality. I'd been really proud and out and all the rest of it, been on pride marches and just anything you can think of to do to accept who I was. When people look at me, they probably don't have a clue what's going on. They just see the weight and think that you should just lose it. And people think it's just as quick as or as easy as that, but it's, it's not. Alex and dieting have met with mixed results. I lost about seven stones, something like that. I went down from 32 to about 25, uh, but then it just stopped. I think there's always been a bit of me that says, you don't deserve it, so I give up. What do you fancy? I have some of the sweet potato. Mike has taken control of Darren's diet to ensure he eats healthily. Can we get Dibsy's meals, please? If I'm in the frame of mind now where the diet side is working for me and I'm seeing results and I'm enjoying the diet, I'm actually enjoying the food. But I know everything I'm eating is right for me. It's good for my body. It's tailored to my size. Thanks, mate. Thank you. Thank you. In this new diet and new lifestyle, I've never lapsed where I've actually went out and done it, but I've had them thoughts loads of times. There was one time when I was close to it. I was close to going back to my old habits for that night. With obesity, it, it is an addiction and it is a mental addiction. So with Dibsy, he needed the support system, he needed people to believe in him, but most of all, he needed to believe in himself. And for so long, I think he lost that belief of being able to overcome the position that he was in. Three, two, one, let's go, Dibs, faster. Dibsy used to consume 11,000 calories a day, which is massive. It's massive for, for probably a family. It's a family's worth of food for one man. And I've had to try and cut him down to 3,500 calories a day. One again. Work him again. Hands up. My workout, I love him. I enjoy him. And although it can be brutal at times. Hands up now, Dibs. Breathe it, breathe it. It's so worth it when you get that sense of accomplishment at the end of it and you walk out and you're sweating and you think, yeah, I've done good there. I've, I've done my best. I've given up my all. You get that sense of, you get a bit of pride in yourself. You're recovered now, mate. You're ready to go. <sighs> yeah, all over again now. <laughs> Let's go, big lad. I pushed Dibsy really hard, but I've got to. I've got to push him hard because Dibsy needed tough love. Right. Get ready, you're going to go into a jog. He's never once said no. He's never once said I can't. He's never once said I'd give up. And I think everyone's got a massive respect for Dibsy as a person now and for who he's become. I've never been this focused and determined to get where I need to be. Seven, this is the fastest you've ever run, Dibs. I'm like a horse with blinkers on. I'm just looking one way, and that's forward. And once I get to that area where I need to be, and that way, and that way I need to be, that's well I'll stay. Right, I've got you, I've got you. Get off the handles. I'm gonna fucking go. All right. Well done. <coughs> awesome work, come on. <sighs> yes, baby. And that, mate, is how champions are made. Darren, known to his mates as Dibsy, has lost over 11 stone in 21 weeks. And that means his life-saving heart surgery is on. But mum Susan is still worried she may lose her son. I am concerned about the operation tomorrow. I probably won't get much sleep tonight, as you know. Because you know what I'm like for worrying about you. It's a big thing to go down and have your, you know, your heart restarted, basically, is what it is. And, uh, yeah, as a mum, you know, we always worry about our kids, and Dibsy's no exception. Well, all a mum ever wants is for the son to get well, isn't it? And it leaves my mind a lot, because I, I don't think you'll realise how much I, I did worry about you, and how much I don't worry about you, even though you you know, you've lost the weight and you're down to 27 stone, you're still big, you know, and there is still a risk. Getting this procedure will mean my whole lifestyle will be better in the fact of I won't get out of breath as quick and 
I can do more physical exercise, just to not have to take medication every day and stuff like that. I'm worried about the procedure just because of my size. I just have to go in with the mindset that nothing's going to go wrong and I'm going to be fine. It's the morning of Darren's heart operation. Ready, Paul? Yeah, mate. Let's go get this done. And despite all his efforts in losing over 11 stone, he is still super morbidly obese, and there is a significant risk he may not survive the procedure. We'll be all right, mate. Yeah. Don't start getting all emotional. We've got this, man. I am scared, yeah. I'm scared, I'm nervous. I'm worried to get the procedure done because someone my size getting to put to sleep isn't good. In Falkirk, Alex is meeting up with his ex-boyfriend, Ben. I met Ben about six years ago now. It started feeling like this was the, the one. This was the special one. Kelpie is really lovely, aren't they? They're really nice. To begin with, me and Ben had a great time. We were always out going for dinners and eating lots of stuff that we shouldn't have eaten. And it was great, just really good fun. But then we realised, look, this is not the best. It's not the best for him, it's not the best for me. So we decided to help each other. We'll sit here. Ben's concerned about Alex. So how are you feeling? I'm feeling OK. I, I, I've... You know, there's times where I feel a bit lonely. Ben fears Alex is eating himself to death and needs to face up to his food addiction. Food has systematically torn his life apart. He has to sleep more, he has less energy, and it's like a, a, a snowball effect. Some of it was just heartbreaking because when you were sort of say, why should I get up? What is it that I yeah, should get when, up for? When someone you love. That's same, really heartbreaking. Yeah. Yeah. I know it hurts you, but it hurts me for the fact that I've said it. I couldn't rely on you for anything. Even if it was like, can we go out into town today? It might be a maybe, yes, OK, we'll do it in a bit. Alex's weight has been a catalyst in our relationship because you had to coordinate everything. How far are we going to walk? Will the seats be big enough in the place? How long do we sit down for? Once you go, oh yeah, I've got worth, I've got value, then you're gonna hold yourself more accountable. Yeah. Then you'll want your health to get better. And as that gets better, you'll have more confidence. And exactly. You can't love people until you love, love yourself. yourself. It's really true. And it is true. I'll let you go in first. Ben's determined to make Alex change his ways to save his life. Getting a message through to Alex is like trying to get through a brick wall sometimes. But you want to be there for that person. Walking here wasn't that bad, actually. No, you could put that into your schedule. You could maybe come here yeah. once a week or whenever. I think just having that routine will help you. Yeah, possibly. I will learn to push forward. That has to begin here now. Unfortunately, you have to push and push and push and push further. You have to break through. It is, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. I come across chilled, but I'm desperately panicking inside. He wants to change. I know that's within him. I've never quite heard him say, do you know what, I want to beat this. I don't want this to own me. I definitely need to move on because I'm 41 now, so I'm not getting any younger, so I need to start losing weight and getting a bit healthier so that I don't die too young. Thank you. You're welcome. After Mark's ultimatum, Alice is finally confronting her eating addiction by seeing a doctor about her obesity. Hi, Alice. Hi, yeah. Are you having any medical issues due to your weight? Yeah, I've got type 2 diabetes, High blood pressure. OK. You've got two children? Yeah, I've got twins. They are six. And are they fit and well? Their weight's fine. So what's in the family? My dad, he's had diabetes for since before I was born. This morning, I found out that my dad's looking at having his other foot off due to bone infection spreading through the diabetes. In my mind, I think that's not going to happen to me, that somehow I'm a medical miracle, you know? 
And you'll avoid it? Yeah. OK. We all like to think it's not going to happen yet. I'm OK. But eventually, at some point, this is going to happen, isn't it? Do you know how heavy you are? 33 stone 8, I think. Come on, then. Let's go over. First, Dr Ghosh needs to determine Alice's body mass index to work out just how obese she is. Mum Jane joins them for the results. Come on in, take a seat. So your weight today was actually 35 stones, so that's two stones heavier than what you thought you were. People with a BMI of over 45 have a 50% higher risk of dying prematurely compared to people of a normal weight. Your BMI came back at 65.8. Your weight is in the super morbidly obese range. I'm certain it's going to have huge detrimental effects on your health. I was totally shocked to hear today that Alice actually weighs more than she thought she did. I knew she was big, obviously, but not that big. My biggest worry is your kids are going to follow exactly what you're doing. Medical fact. If a parent has an eating disorder, the child's heavily likely to have an eating disorder. Your kids are watching how their mum copes with stress. And what they're doing is they're going, that's all right, because that's how my mum coped with stress. So your biggest motivation shouldn't be about saving your life. Your biggest motivation needs to be about saving the life of your family. Yeah, I'm putting my life in danger. It never crossed my mind that by doing that, it ultimately is going to put the kids in danger. This is the actual push that Alice needs. It's hopefully changed her mindset to thinking about not her and what the weight's doing to her, but what it's doing to her family. My worst fear is that my children end up big and in a cycle like I have. I can't do to my children what I've done to myself. That's just not the way it's going to work. I was looking for that final shock and I think I've got it. <laughs> Come on, then. With the help of her family, Alice has started to take the first steps towards a new, healthier life. In Middlesbrough, Mum Susan is waiting for Darren to return home from his life-or-death heart procedure. Oh, thank God for that he's all. Hello! You all right? Are you all right? Yes. Oh, thank God for that, you're all right. God, we have to go and tend to the dozen. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Mike. So, did the operation go? Just before I went down, they said that, because I'm such a high risk, they weren't willing to put me to sleep. And they sort of said, we're just heavily sedated, yeah, so we're going to be ketamine and stuff, and just basically knocked me out with that. They usually shock three times to get your heart rate back. If it doesn't work the first or second, they'll go up with three scores. He said to me, we're only willing to go with you once. You're only willing to do it once? Yeah, because they said that it's too much of a risk to do it two or three times with you. His upper chambers of his heart could have had a clot there, so when they started beating, that clot could have went straight to his brain and given him a stroke. And they did tell us that, and it was under no uncertain circumstances that that could happen. So that was a massive risk. It was a massive worry. Yeah, I was shitting myself, but... See, I couldn't let all you know that. Last night, I was laying in bed trying to sleep, and I was thinking, what about if I don't come back here tomorrow? What about if... What about if this is my last night in this bed? Something could go wrong here. I'm just glad it's done, to be honest. We've done it. Well, let's hope we never have to go through it again, eh? No, oh, well... I'm just so pleased that everything went well as it should have. And, uh, yeah, it's nice to have my boy back. I used to be... Like a bed and a mum. It just genuinely saddens me that that she was going through that and I didn't even know because I was that oblivious to what I was doing. I think he'll always have an addiction. His addiction now is exercise. Where he was looking for food for comfort, now he's looking to do exercise for comfort. Them temptations creep back in still. I still want certain foods that I can't have. I'm not going to sit here and say that I don't, because I don't. Darren's now lost over 14 stone. Well done, mate. Thank you. Love you. Team effort.